Good morning, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath. As we continue in our study of the Minor Prophets today, we are going to be segueing into Zechariah 5, and we're going to, to be examining several things that we find within this particular book. Let's be prepared. This will offer a lot of examples that we're going to need to delve into deeply. And there's going to be several things that we're going to need to examine on top of this book. So shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction so that we may more fully understand that which we are about to read? Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we come before you today knowing that we have sinned, knowing that we are in need of your mercy. For all have sinned and fallen short of your glory. There is none that are righteous, no, not one. Please forgive us of our sins, Father. We thank you for this Sabbath day. We thank you for this opportunity to open your word, to come before you, to learn. We ask, Father, for your angels, for your spirit, and for your guidance to direct us in all that we say and all that we do. Be with us now, Father. Show us what we need to consider for this time in which we live. Help us to be prepared and to be guided in the steps that you would have us to take. I thank you for those that are joining in this meeting. I thank you for those that will view it later. And ask, Father, for your blessing upon us all. For this we thank you. For this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. We are going to delve into Zechariah 5. We're going to look at the first four verses of this book, and we're going to look at some other corollaries to go with it. So Zechariah 5 is now up before us. We are going to go through this. We're going to look at this flying roll, and that's going to be our major point of examination today. So Zechariah begins. Then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked and beheld a flying roll. And he said unto me, what seest thou? And I answered, I see a a flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits and the breadth thereof is 10 cubits. Brothers and sisters, last week we heard that we are not to consider numbers. Yet here are numbers presented within Scripture. I thought that all Scripture is good for admonition, for correction, and for reproof. Does that not include numbers? Balmona, yes. Okay. But, and it's not, well, I mean, we have Palmona, but all throughout Scripture, we have numbers used in symbolic ways that are well attested to and that Seventh-day Adventists would recognize. So, I mean, 666, is that a number? Yes. We understand the symbolism of 7, of 3, of 12, of 70. Of Of seven times. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm just saying stuff that every Adventist would accept. You know, we're going to see 70 AD as a symbol of judgment because of the 70 years, right? And Right. And I've never run into an Adventist who says, no, 70 AD, it's just a coincidence. They all see it as in God's providence. And so we see the structure of prophetic chronology. I mean, the whole, the whole thing that happened with me personally was just studying the prophecies of the Old Testament, the 2520 to 2300 days, and finding out that there was this structure with no intention of time setting or applying it to the present at all. So, But the fact that those numbers exist, you know, the measuring of the temple. I mean, if you have the measuring of the temple in Ezekiel and it's just doesn't mean anything, why is it there? Right. You know, there would be so many parts of scripture we would just abandon. And and why is Ezekiel giving us all of these, these dates? Why is he, you know, beginning on July 21st on the fifth day of the fourth month? And why is he, you know, begin, you know, to lie on his left side? Why does he lie on his right side beginning on 
you know, August 15th. You know, why does he do that? Why is he giving us, you know, the 30 years? Why is he, he giving us any of that information if it's not important? Well, we can and, what, that. and why is he giving us, why is he giving us people's, uh, how many, how, how long people live back be, um, before the flood? Agreed. Yeah. And when, why do these things produce these symbols that we recognize? Right. So this, this has been attested to throughout the Christian era. Um, throughout the Judaism, that, the, that these numbers are symbolic. You know, the 22 years from uh, Joseph's dream until it's fulfilled, it, it's just an attested fact, right? Uh, the chiasms in scripture, the, the 70th week, and all of the symbols that come from that, and its connection to the 22520. So you can't talk about the 2520s without addressing uh, the chiasms and the symbols that exist. So a renunciation of, of these symbols. Now, a person could say, well, we could use those those symbols, but we can't apply them to what's happening now, except that they do apply to what's happening now. Jeff is going to speak 1,260 days after July 18th and three years and 187 days after he last spoke. I don't I don't see how it's possible. To, for this movement to reject the symbolic use of numbers. The whole point and the reason I bring this up, I, I find it very disappointing that after all of the study that has been going on since 1989, since September 11, 2001, in so many different ways, that the numbers that have brought us to a clearer understanding are now being set aside. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is asked here in Zechariah 5.2. And he said unto me, what seest thou? What are we seeing here? Why is this flying scroll with a length of 20 cubits and a breadth of 10 cubits important for us to consider? Now, as, as Zechariah continues in the next two verses, then he said unto me, this is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For every one that stealeth shall be cut off as on this side according to it. And every one that sweareth shall be cut off on that side according to it. I will bring forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the thief and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. And it shall remain in the midst of his house and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. So this flying scroll, 20 cubits by 10 cubits, is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. What curse goes over the entire earth? The 2520. Thank you. Yeah. Now, in this situation, what else can we determine about the dimensions of this flying scroll? Okay, well, the circumference is, because um, you know, Stephen Jameson you know, says it actually has a connection to the holy place in the tabernacle, the 20 by 10, right? So, so we have that. But the circumference is going to be 20 plus 20 plus 10 plus 10, which is 60, right? So it's, it's, the circumference is 60 cubit or 60 okay. cubit. I'm, okay, now help, help me understand. I always applied circumference as being something that was round. No. Okay. Anything that, any shape has a circumference. So the circumference is is just the the outer edge, right? So you take the the length and the height of of a scroll or a roll here, right? I was this, okay, right. I always thought that was the perimeter. Well, you could use perimeter. Okay. Right. Iran says it's perimeter. I thought okay. it was uh, radius, but I could be wrong. Yes. Okay, so we'll call it the perimeter. It maybe maybe that's correct. Maybe I've been using the word circumference wrong all my life. But anyway, if you take the perimeter, the 
outside of it. Yeah, you're probably right. Circumference probably does refer to a circle, just if you think about the word itself. And just um, just to to follow up on what William was saying, a yeah. radius would be half of a perimeter. No, a radius is half of a diameter of a okay, circle. Okay, diameter, excuse me. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, so the perimeter is 60 cubits, right? Okay. Now, 60, if we take this as relating to the sanctuary, because of the 20 by 10, right? Right. Um, and we use the 21 inch, uh, cubit. Uh, the perimeter is 1260 inches. Okay. Right? And of course, there's two sides, right? There's the one side, right? So you're going to look at, and, and these relate to the law, right? Because you got the steeleth. That's the second tablet. Right. Of the commandments. And, and then the swareth, that's, you know, taking the name of the Lord God in vain, right? So that's going to be on the first tablet. Now, some people say it's bearing false witness. Um, but, but I, I apply it to the first tablet. So you get the first tablet and the second, or the first table and the second table of the law, right? right. So the point is both, if you measure it both, two 1260s is 2520. So that, that's how I've heard it done before. Okay. So we have this playing role. Would we at this time consider this in, in the verbiage that we would use or in the language that we would use? Would this be a flying book? Yeah. Be flying well, book, yeah. I would take it more as a scroll. I mean, if you want to call it a book, because it's just, it's just got, um, to me, it's the table of the law the two tables of the law that are being represented. Okay. Now, Zechariah is being presented with this, and the Lord, in verse 5-4, said he will bring it forth, and it's going to enter into the house of the thief and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name, and it shall remain in the midst of the house and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. What else can we say about this flying scroll based upon this particular verse? Does this scroll destroy the house of the thief if it consumes it? Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Okay. Now, in considering the different verses that the translators had used in support of everything in these four verses. Zechariah 5.1 is being compared with Ezekiel 2 verse 9. Now, Ezekiel 2 is the first vision of Ezekiel, right? Yeah, that's in his first vision. Okay. And in this first vision, Ezekiel records, and when I looked, behold, and hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. They use the word book there. Yes. <laughs> kind of interesting, isn't it? Yeah. So why would Ezekiel then say a roll of a book was therein? What do we, what can we determine from this? Maybe part, part of the book? Correct. Now, when we consider this, we have a roll being the Hebrew number 4039, or volume. And we have book, Hebrew 5612. Yeah, so the so book is is literally just means a writing, right? So so something that's written down because it's uh, sefer. Right. So that means like to write. So so it's 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 a scroll with writing on it. Is what it, it's saying. Okay. Right. Yeah. So five, six, and two. Now, Ezekiel, after after he had made the comment, when he looked, behold, and hand was sent unto me, lo, a roll of a book was therein, and he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. Whenever we are looking at this and we are given 
something that brings us to lamentations and mourning and woe, what have we determined is being referenced? Is it not Islam? Is it not something for us to pay attention with? Okay. Why would you say Islam? Whoa. Yeah, well, that's, that I wouldn't just take that um, and apply just to Islam. Well, I, I find it interesting because in this, this particular word that's used in Ezekiel 2.10, the one that is, mm-hmm. that was used as woe, that's 19. The- yeah. It's the only time that's ever been used in the Bible. Yeah, exactly. Now it is related to um five zero nine two, but Okay. Um but uh the and, and the idea of this is that it's more an elegy that is a lamentation, right? So even though they already have the word lamentations there, that is a dirge, uh mourning that's muttering. Right. So all of these are auditory um, descriptions of mourning. Okay. Right. That I mean, that's the main idea here. So now the thing is, it's it's auditory, but these are written down. Right. Okay. So so we have these auditory descriptions of mourning. They're they're describing things that would be spoken out loud or sung, as in the case of the dirge. The mumbling, the mourning is the muttering or sighing. And then uh, this lamentation, this last one, is uh, wailing, I guess, is probably the best way to look at it. So it's kind of, I mean, I don't know how you write down wailing, um, but uh, but that's that's what it means. Okay. Now in Zechariah 5.3. Then he said unto me, this is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. The translators here chose to give reference to Malachi 4.6. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and spite and smite the earth with a curse. What did we learn when we were going through this in Malachi? Why is this important for us to consider in reference to Zechariah five three. Well wouldn't it be because of the twenty five twenty? That's a good part of it, yes. <clears throat> but why why would the translators look at this and give reference back to turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers? <clears throat> Do we not see the failures that have happened from one generation to another, especially in our dependence upon God. When we were addressing things last evening, and as we have every Friday night, when we are looking at the situation of righteousness by faith, how can we become righteous by faith? Is it not by our complete and total dependence upon Christ. Upon his righteousness. And on his righteousness is correct. But throughout the generations within the church, have we not seen the first generation turning away the second generation not understanding what the first understood, the third not understanding what the first and the second understood, and the fourth generation being way out in the woods, not understanding anything of the first three generations. How else are we to see this? Do we wish to be those on whom this curse is proclaimed? Do we wish to be adjudged as being a thief? No. Uh -uh. Do we wish to be one that takes the name of the Lord in vain? In other words, says, I'm under covenant with Christ, and then goes off and does exactly as we please to do. Is that the way we're to, to react? But the reality is we all 
have transgressed these laws. We all are thieves and we all uh, take the name of the Lord God in vain. Right. Right. So, I mean, this is about the destruction of self. I mean, so, I mean, it's going to happen to all of us. The question is, if we only have this righteousness to stand on, then then we, we don't have Christ's righteousness at all to protect us. Right. So all of us are guilty of these things. So all of us then are guilty of rejecting the offered blessings of Leviticus 25, and we are all falling under the curses of Leviticus 26. But God's people fall under those curses. Yeah. Because remember, those curses are corrective chastisements. Right. I mean, the, the, the purpose of Leviticus 26, even though it's, you know, the pretty harsh judgments, um, is that God wants to restore them in the end. The promise is always a restoration. And that did literally happen for ancient Israel. Right. The temple is destroyed, but it's going to be rebuilt. You know, right. They go into captivity, but they're released from captivity. And, and so this is what the law shows us. The law only can condemn us. This flying scroll, you know, that contains the law, it, it, it can't save us, right? It's just going to condemn us. So we need a savior. So now, Zechariah 5, 4, I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the thief and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. The next verses that were being used, Leviticus 19.12, Zechariah 8.17, and Malachi 3.5. And ye shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. Now when we see this, I am the Lord, who is speaking here? Well, the Lord. When Christ walked among the children of Israel, did he not refer to himself many times with different phrases of I am? Yeah, so this is Christ. I mean, he's he's the one who always is the word. He's the one who reveals himself in the Old Testament. So Christ is giving this instruction in Leviticus. And mm-hmm. of course, that which is given in Leviticus is directed for us today because are we not the levites of the current generation Mm -hmm. so we are not to swear by his name falsely we are not to profane the name of the lord thy god otherwise we are dishonoring christ now zechariah 8 17 interesting verse especially with the numbers Let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor and love no false oath. For all these things I hate, saith the Lord. If we run the numbers backwards, we again have 718. We are not to imagine evil against our neighbor. And who is our neighbor? Is this not an instruction that we are not to imagine evil against any brother or sister within the church and those with whom we come in contact. So it simply means everyone? Yes, it does. And now we have Malachi 3, five. And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against the false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages the widow and the fatherless and that turn aside the stranger from his right and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. Do we want to have it said of us that we are a sorcerer or that we are adulterers or that we are swearing falsely or that we are oppressing people? All of these things the Lord hates. Now here, the last of the verses that the 
translators had used in reference to shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. Leviticus 14.45 And he shall break down the house, the stones of it, and the timber thereof, and all the mortar of the house. And he shall carry them forth out of the city into an unclean place. Why? The house of those that are the thief that swear falsely by his name, the adulterers, the sorcerers, the false swearers, their house will be utterly destroyed. They will be carried forth out of the city into an unclean place. Do we want to find ourselves being placed in an unclean place? No, we don't. So what is Zachariah saying to us here? We have a flying scroll. How many of us have ever seen a flying scroll? How many of us have ever seen a flying book? No, somebody's thrown it at you. Okay. But have you ever seen a scroll or a book with wings that could fly on its own? Nope. So when we are examining this portion, what is this vision? Is this a literal situation or is this a prophetic situation? It's got to be prophetic. So if it, if it needs to be prophetic, how are we to look at this? Uh, when uh, So are we not going to look uh, on it like, uh, for example, Ezekiel was given a book to eat, which simply means it's a message. Are we not going to look at it like uh, a message which is coming unto us? It is a message coming unto us, yes. Now, I'm going to share another document. Is this um, other document? Uh, just a little comment here. Okay. So this scroll, um, so it's it's 10 by 20 cubits, right? Correct. And then we said that we could uh, use 21 inches per cubit, which would make uh, the ends of it 210 inches and the sides 420 inches, right? Right, correct. And then we could actually... Uh, Divide that uh, diagonally to get two triangles, right? Okay. And um, if we take, uh, so these are two right triangles. And if we take um, uh, H, which is like the height of that triangle from the right triangle corner uh, to side C, it's going to be 187 inches and a decimal point. It's just an interesting Plus the area is 44,100, which is 144,000 kind of backwards. So anyway, it's just analyzing the triangle. And here, here again, we have very intriguing numbers. Now, did this other document come up on the screen? Yeah. Just okay. get rid of all tools things on the left side. Just hit that little X. This X? Um, where it says all tools on the left. Left okay. side. And there's the X to the right of the all tools. Just take Got that. It. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So we have Man Manuscript 7 of 1875, entitled Separation from the World. This was not previously published. So the first paragraph here. The angel repeated with solemnity these words. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Matthew 10, 37 and 39. Now, it's interesting that the way she wrote this says that the angel repeated with solemnity these words. Christ is the one that first gave us this admonition. So here is an angel that is repeating this. Those who are continually seeking to save their good name in the world, who dress, 
talk and act like the world and unite with the mass of professed Christians in order to have influence among them and are to be approved of them are seeking to save their lives. Brothers and sisters, are we to live in the world? Are we to live and act like those in the world? Uh, we are supposed to be living in the world, but we are not supposed to be of the world. Agreed. Every case passes in review before Christ in the heavenly sanctuary before he ceases to plead for man. So here, Mrs. White is being very direct. Christ is investigating. While he serves as our high priest in the heavenly day of atonement, he is reviewing all cases before he ceases to plead for us. Every name is repeated by the recording angel. Their moral worth is estimated. Their acts and their deeds are weighed in an even balance and they are rewarded according to their works. Those who served the world and who were ashamed of the cross of Christ, who studied their own convenience rather than the will of God. Their names are read by the recording angel and are pronounced unworthy of Christ's protection and love. And their life is lost beyond redemption. What does that say to you? What does it mean to you that life is lost beyond redemption? I mean, they've lost eternal life. That is, there's no turning back. Right. Now, if they are pronounced unworthy of Christ's protection and love, when the plagues are poured out, are those that are beyond redemption, will they be protected when the plagues are poured out? No. So um, so just so when we deal with this judgment, so we know that these are people who profess to believe the truth. Right. right. So we know Christ starts with the righteous dead. Right. Those that profess, those that have accepted Christ as their savior, follow the truth. Now, we know that some of those people that ha that go into this judgment are going to be condemned. So I'm not I'm not I've never been quite certain exactly who these people are, because we talk about the righteous that that are being judged. The wicked are not judged until after the thousand years, so to speak. But but there are people, there is a judgment that's going on that does affect people who profess to believe in Christ. Right. right. So so that means even though we call it the judgment of of the righteous dead and the righteous living, included in that are people who are going to be declared unrighteous. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So so it really has to do with a person's profession um, of belief. That is, there are some people that they're not involved in that judgment at all. The judgment of the Day of Atonement. They haven't professed anything in regard to Christ, you know, or his truth. They haven't made a profession of faith of, of any sort. They're just not counted in that judgment. Would, would we agree with that? I think what you're saying is logical. Yeah. Yeah, it's just not something we generally think about in too much detail. But we know that that it is it's called the judgment of the righteous dead and the righteous living, right? So so obviously the righteous are dealt with in this judgment and they will be declared righteous, but there are others who must be declared unrighteous. That is that day of atonement judgment is not is not going to apply to them. So the way that we look at it is as Seventh day Adventists is we have sins that are confessed upon an offering upon Christ, right? And and those sins go into the heavenly sanctuary. And then the heavenly sanctuary is going to be cleansed from the sins of the righteous. The sins of the wicked don't enter into the heavenly sanctuary, correct? Correct. Right. 
So the sanctuary is defiled because of sins that are confessed. Now, now a person may have confessed their sins and they may have gone into judgment, but that person can uh, recant of that. So this is where I've never really been certain exactly how this works. So, you know, I don't have the answer to it. Um, but we do know that there are going to be those that are declared righteous and declared wicked. And and when that happens, when the close of probation occurs, those wicked are not just people who are who have not been acquainted with the truth. Those wicked are people who have known the truth. Right. Correct. Right. Otherwise, if they hadn't known the truth, they couldn't have closed their probation, you know, in that way. Right. While still alive. So as, as we're looking at this further, yeah. as, we're, as we're addressing this, those who serve the world and who are ashamed of the cross of Christ, who mm-hmm. study their own convenience rather than the will of God, their names are read by the recording angel and are pronounced unworthy of Christ's protection and love. And their life is lost beyond redemption. The prince of life is ashamed of them and disowns them before his father and his holy angels. Right. So this must be those that names whose names those that have actually asked their sins to be forgiven at some time in their life. Right. Right. So this isn't just a casual person, um, because if their name is going to pass in review in the heavenly sanctuary. Um, then that means they're part of the judgment of what we would call the righteous. That's the way that I understand it. So, because we have the judgment of the righteous dead and the judgment of the righteous living. So all who had professed to believe Christ had asked for forgiveness for their sins at some time in their life. But now when the test comes, they, they reject Christ. And, and this is a pretty solemn thing. Because there are people, you know, they don't know Christ. They don't know much about God or anything. Um, you know, they might have gone to church and they might have heard some words. But to them, it was didn't mean anything. They never came to Christ and asked for forgiveness. All right. Those who have left all to follow Christ in this world, denied themselves and endured reproach for his sake, choosing Christ before the world, And every earthly friend. And esteem the cross of Christ. Greater riches than any worldly treasure. Will save their lives. So these are the ones. Whose lives. Will not be forfeit. Their names are read by the recording angel. And Jesus repeats their names. With his own dear voice. He acknowledges them as his jewels before his father and the heavenly host. Now, when he is acknowledging them as his jewels, what's being referred to here? What what application can we make? Does this not give us a reference to William Miller's dream? The jewels that are placed within the casket, they are counted worthy of everlasting life. Their every error and past sin is blotted out. Every transgression is covered, and he bids the angel with the writer's inkhorn to place a mark or a sign upon their foreheads that the destroying angel may pass them over and not hurt them. Where do we find the angel with the writer's inkhorn? Ezekiel, ain't it? And what chapter, brother? I think it's chapter 8. Oh, it's, yeah, chapter 8. You're close. I believe it's chapter 9. Okay, 9. I was going to say 9. Then he gives another angel, clad in warlike garments, directions to go forth and follow the angel with the writer's inkhorn, and slay utterly old and young, both men and women, and little children. Those who were ashamed of Christ are appointed among the number to be cut down by the destroying angel. That name they cherish too highly to be given to Christ, that they wish to preserve to be honored by the world, they lose. 
it finds no place in the book of life. It lives not among the holy angels. It finds its place in the book of death to be lost among those appointed unto death. Isn't it interesting how this document had not been published, even though Mrs. White wrote this in 1875? Would this not have had some effect upon the thoughts and writings of Victor Hotev had this particular book, this particular document been made available? When was that published again? 1875. It was not published for us until... 2015. Oh, my my goodness. Kind of surprising. Yeah, yeah so you're saying that uh, with Victor Hotef, he was teaching that that they're going to be the ones that do the destroying. Right. Now, is is that actually correct, or is that a misrepresentation of what he taught? No, it's, it's pretty correct. Okay. Yeah, just because, I mean, I know that um, Shepherd's Rods believe that, but um, don't I just I didn't find it in his early stuff, but you know I haven't read everything he ri- he's written. Okay. Now, I know a bit about uh, Shepherd's Rod. But, uh, the reason that that this document became important as I prepared and was led to prepare for this study has to do with a couple of other documents that we will be getting into as we continue in this book. Now, my admonition for each of us as we prepare for this following Sabbath is going to be to consider carefully these four verses in Zechariah. There is much more here that we have not addressed today. There is a lot for us to need to consider within these four verses. And there's going to be quite a bit that we're going to be considering that was written within the spirit of prophecy. We're examining, as we have been on Friday evenings, as we have in the daily studies, as we have each Sabbath the need that we have for our characters to become like that of Christ's. If our character is not like Christ's, will we be saved? This is the consideration that we're going to need in all that we are studying and considering at this time. We have the character of the world or we have the character of Christ. Correct. So now... Are there any other comments or questions regarding that which we have examined today? Probably not time for me, but study those chapters Okay, would be something to do. Right. Well, I, I found it interesting that this chapter of Zechariah has a total of 11 verses. It's not a hard read, but when... Right. Once you really start considering what's being said, there is a lot under the surface that I don't think that we have ever really looked at. So that's why we're going to continue with these thoughts as we continue to go through this book. So shall we close our session for today? Gracious Father in heaven, thank you for the warnings and the admonitions that are placed within this book from the prophet Zechariah, especially the admonitions for this day. We ask now, Father, for your guidance. We ask for your direction. Help us that we may look to you to learn the path where we need to walk. May your will be done. I pray, Father, for your blessing upon Brother Stephen and upon those that are coming to hear the study that comes next. Be with us, each one. Direct us according to your will. For this, we thank you, and for this, we praise you. Now and always, in Jesus' name, 
Amen.